Hey everyone, my name is Lucy and I want to welcome you and thank you so much for joining me on this first episode of Permaculture Perspectives. Sorry about the bad video quality. This is going to be a vlog podcast type of um, YouTube series where I'm going to be discussing various aspects of permaculture and approaches to permaculture um, and I'll also be exhibiting some artistic sort of projects related to permaculture that I'm working on. So thank you again for being here for this first episode. Today what I wanted to talk about was permaculture as a definition or a conversation. I really prefer to look at permaculture as a conversation, but first I'm going to talk a little bit about it as a definition. So I think having a succinct definition of what permaculture is, is really important, especially for people who haven't come across permaculture before or who've maybe heard about it but don't know exactly what it is. So the succinct definition that I like to use is that it is an approach to sustainable systems design, which looks at nature as a model and a teacher. And it's based on three core ethics, which are care of the earth, care of people, and what's known as fair share or redistribution of the surplus, sometimes also called future care. Because you gotta care about the future generations, honey. So having this type of definition is definitely a sort of springboard for further discussion about what permaculture is. And so the main way that people understand permaculture um, in regards to this definition is a way of designing um, food and material producing systems like food forests or permaculture gardens and orchards. Um, I'm sure most people have seen photos of what this might look like and these are amazing. And more and more people are also getting into this other side of permaculture now which is social permaculture which is pretty much applying the exact same principles that we apply to land-based permaculture to designing social systems. And this can mean anything from a school, a community center, a community, um, a local economy based on alternative currencies, um, your inner self, even your relationships with other people. So permaculture is a really versatile um, sort of bag of tools that you can pull out and design culture essentially because that's what permaculture stands for. It stands for permanent culture which means a culture that can be sustained indefinitely over time. Um, and I think I think that's where the sort of benefits of having a succinct definition for permaculture kind of reach their limit. Um, and I've been doing a lot of research on social and ecological justice lately, so this is definitely where this is coming from. But I think that um, even when we start to talk about a permanent culture that's sustainable, a lot of people have a vision of what they want that to be, but maybe it's not discussed enough on the table. And we live in a world where there's a huge amount of disparity and a huge amount of inequality, both in terms of how people are treated and how non-human living and non-living elements of the earth are treated. And I think um, when we want to design systems based on natural ecosystems, we can't do that unless we realize what systems we're a part of already and be really aware of those linkages. So, for example, when we say that we want a permanent culture, who's going to be included in that culture? Um, is it, are we talking only about the local town that we live in? And even when we're only talking on that level, who I mean, who are we including in that vision of a permanent culture and who are we not including? I think most often than not, there's definitely people that we tend to put on the back burner or forget about. And we definitely have to be aware of that. Um, we, we live in a culture that's very exclusive and it's very, very polarized and it's very easy for people who have a lot of privilege to kind of not think about that. And I think, um, 
when we're talking, for example, about the third ethic of permaculture, which is if you have a surplus of something, you should redistribute it equitably so that there's enough for everyone. Um, I think that that one really hits home in a world where there's so much inequality. And so we have to think about redistributing the surplus to who? Like who's gonna get the benefits of the surplus? Are the people who really need it the ones who are really getting it? And this can be applied on so many different scales and this video could be like a two hour long discussion which I don't want it to be. I just want it to be a sort of um, generator of ideas I think for people who are involved in permaculture um, and just sort of an encouragement to people to continue to have conversations. So something that's really interesting that's come out of the permaculture movement, for example, is this idea of liberation permaculture. The idea that permaculture can be a tool for reconnecting people who have been um, oppressed or um, forcibly displaced or displaced for whatever reason from their original lives to something that um, they didn't choose. And having permaculture as a way of reconnecting them to the community and of sort of finding community and finding some sort of a connection to the earth wherever they may be, even if that's in a poor neighborhood in downtown Vancouver or inner city Detroit. Um, I think there's really a tendency, especially in Western culture, to reproduce a lot of the same power dynamics and inequalities that we've grown up with and that we don't believe in. Um, that's something that I'm becoming really aware of in my own life. And so I think that for people who practice permaculture, we need to be aware of these things too. And so I think that awareness really comes from paying attention to voices that aren't being heard around us and listening for those stories that we haven't been hearing. Um, I think a really good example of this that I've already spoken to a few people about, for me, this is my personal story, is that um, I became aware of how urban agriculture can actually contribute to gentrification. And so I went to this conference um, a, few, a few weeks ago and I went to a workshop on social justice and urban food production. And I was so excited to go, I was not really knowing what to expect. but. There were three presenters and the third presenter presented on urban agriculture in Vancouver, which is where I'm from. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I love urban agriculture and I'm from Vancouver. This is really exciting. But what she talked about was actually kind of eye-opening for me in a not so great way. She talked about, so in Vancouver, there's this peri-urban area called Richmond, and there's also an, a few other peri-urban areas that are very strongly linked to agriculture. And really, if we're talking about food security, which is a topic that comes up a lot in permaculture, the peri-urban areas of Vancouver are so important to Vancouver's food security. Um, and so the presenter was talking about how all this land that was in this agricultural land trust, which meant that it could only ever be used for agriculture in this peri-urban area surrounding Vancouver, is now being taken out of the agricultural land trust. And the way that that happens is that the land is valued at these astronomical prices and farmers can't afford to buy the land. And so what happens is that it's dedicated to other uses, such as construction waste holding site. And what the construction waste does is that it actually degrades the quality of the soil so that it is no longer suitable for agriculture. So when it's tested and found not suitable for agriculture, it can then be applied to be taken out of the agricultural land fund. And so that's how Vancouver is losing a lot of its peri-urban agricultural land to non-agricultural uses, which is hugely detrimental to its food security. And there's tons of activism happening around this, but having grown up in Vancouver, I was never really exposed to any of that. Um, and I realized how privileged I am to not have heard those stories. And I really wish I had. And so the other side of the story was that, meanwhile, in downtown Vancouver, in the Vancouver core, there's all, in the past five years, there have been like tens of urban gardens that have been just sprouting up all over the place. And a lot of these are really awesome initiatives, not to say that they're not, but 
I think when there's a lack of awareness of the like bigger power struggles that these gardens are a part of, um, they can contribute to things that we as permaculturists are really hoping they're gonna help eliminate such as gentrification. So what happens a lot of the times in Vancouver is that urban agricultural lots are owned by land developers but the land developers will, will say okay for the next 10 years I'm not going to touch this land if this organization wants to build an urban garden on it go ahead. And a lot of the times these gardens are found on marginal land and in marginalized neighborhoods. Um, and so if there isn't a plan to directly involve long-term um, the well-being of the people who live in these neighborhoods, then they're not really gonna benefit. So a few of the gardens, for example, will hire people who live in these neighborhoods, but then will sell the majority of the food to upscale restaurants instead of contributing to the food security of the neighborhoods that are the least food secure. Um, which, and this isn't all of them, of course, but this does happen in some cases and then this whole process sort of attracts investment because an urban garden looks really great and it contributes to the slow gentrification process the sort of changing of the social makeup of certain neighborhoods so when the time comes to develop the land in 10 years time the neighborhood now looks different and there's people around who weren't around before who can now afford to buy say condos and this process of sort of five to ten year urban gardens really does not contribute to food security in Vancouver, but it looks really good and it gets a lot of press attention. Meanwhile, the real agricultural land surrounding Vancouver is being destroyed. And so I think when we're talking about developing things based on ecosystems, we have to look at what are the systems that we're a part of already, what are our linkages, and how can we um, shift the way that energy is exchanged in order for the surplus to really be divided equitably amongst the people that need it. And I think um, I tuned into this really cool question and answer session with Naomi Klein. Um, she was answering some questions based on her new book, This Changes Everything, at my university in Sweden. And um, someone put up their hand. I don't know how this came up, but it came up. She said that, you know, when we're, whenever we're talking about um, shifting away from a system that's based on inequality, oppression, and injustice, um, whether this be social or ecological, which are really two sides of the exact same coin, um, it's those people who have sort of suffered the most at the hands of the system that should be allowed to speak the loudest, to reap the benefits, and to lead any transitions away from the system and this is really the only sustainable way of actually doing it and I think that um, this kind of information and these kinds of conversations should really be um, had by permaculturists for many different reasons um, if you guys have any more ideas on this or want to contribute specific ideas for further podcasts I would be so open to that um, and I'm really looking forward to having amazing conversations with permaculture people and future permaculture people and people in general. Because I don't think it has to be called permaculture to be permaculture. It doesn't really matter what it's called. With that said, thank you guys so much for joining me on this first episode of Permaculture Perspectives. And if you liked the video, please click like. Um, please feel free to subscribe to my channel. I promise I will have more videos coming up soon. If you have any comments, questions, critiques, ideas, suggestions, please um, post them below in the comment section. And I look forward to starting a conversation. See you later. Thank you.